All right. Well, good morning and happy Monday. So I want to pick up where we left off in IR spectroscopy. And what I'm going to do is sort of continue our discussion of kind of basic, basic elements of the theory of IR spectroscopy, mostly stuff that affects us. And then we're going to talk a little bit about instrumentation and really from the point of view of understanding what an IR spectrophotometer does um, and maybe a little bit on understanding FTIR, which most IR spectrophotometers are these days. And then I want to start moving on and talking about uh, reading IR spectra. And I really mean this term literally in the sense that it's not just looking at band positions, it's understanding shapes and intensities that allow you to get insight into functional groups. So, okay, when we were talking last time, we were talking about uh, various stretching frequencies and I've referred to uh, the term wave numbers. So for example, the, um, the carbonyl say, the carbon oxygen double bond stretch is on the order of approximately 1700 wave numbers. We call it CM to the negative one, or you'll hear it referred to as nu bar. And that's not a term that we see in many sorts of spectra. We're used to things like nanometers in UV visible spectra, or maybe maybe frequency. So I wanted to at least have us understand what this term is, right? So nu bar is a way of saying waves per centimeter. So in other words, it's the inverse of wavelength. It's the reciprocal of wavelength. And by convention, it's what we often use for IR spectra. So what does that mean in more familiar terms? Well, it means 1 over 1700. If this is waves per centimeter, then that would be centimeter per wave. Or the, the generally more familiar term would be wavelength. So we would say that's lambda, right? Wave length. And then if we just take that number, we're going to get 5.9 times 10 to the negative four centimeters. Or perhaps in more convenient units, we could refer to that in microns. So that would be 5.9 microns, micrometers. And if we think about a typical IR spectrum, maybe as running 4,000 to 600 wave numbers, then we translate that to microns, that's 2.5 to 17 Micron. So just to put that into context of the electromagnetic spectrum, the visible spectrum, right, runs about 400 or three something to about 700-ish, you know, so if we say 200 to 800 nanometers for the UV visible spectrum, so that's just under one micron, then if we shift over beyond the near IR, that brings us to the familiar IR where we're exciting vibrational transitions. So I think that's enough said about, about wave numbers, but I think that sort of puts this into, into context of what we're doing. Any questions on, on that uh, spectral range? <laughs> 
All right, so let's go ahead. I want to talk about effects of wavelength of uh, bond strength and mass. Just so we can sort of calibrate ourselves. So to get, get an idea of calibration, so you probably had physical chemistry or something akin to it where you've learned about a quantum oscillator. So if we think about a bond in the gross oversimplification of two masses connected by a spring with a force constant K, and we solve for, for the oscillator. So I'm not going to do that, but we get that that nu bar is one over two pi C, the speed of light root K over mu, where mu is the reduced mass. So mu equals M1 times M2 divided by M1 plus M2. Does that equation look familiar as something you've seen back, back in the past? So I want to take a look at this from my own perspective, and that is in a perspective as an organic chemist where we think about bond strengths. So if a carbon-oxygen single bond has a stretching frequency of about 1,100 wave numbers, give or, give or take about 100. And I've said sort of a generic carbonyl is about 1,700 wave numbers. And we think about a carbon-oxygen double bond, it's pretty strong. It's just about twice as strong as a carbon-oxygen single bond. Does this, does this make sense? And it kind of does. In other words, this relationship would suggest to us that if the bond is twice as strong, if K is twice as big, we're going to have a factor not of two in the, in the wavelength, in the frequency in, in nu bar, but a factor of root two. And so, you know, if you squint, it's about root two times greater, maybe, maybe a hair more, but it's not twice as big. And that's kind of a good, good calibration point there. I think the other good calibration point is it kind of gets us to some, some unknowns where you may be able to calibrate yourself on things that you don't even think you know. For example, even though I don't know that much, well, maybe I know a little bit, about a carbon-nitrogen double bond, you can start to say, wait a second, nitrogen's pretty similar to oxygen. The bond strengths are going to be reasonably similar. The pi bonds are going to be reasonably similar. And the difference in mass between nitrogen and oxygen between 14 and 16 is relatively negligible. In other words, mu bar, uh, mu, the reduced mass, isn't going to differ by that much. So even if you've never seen an imine before in the IR spectrum, you're going to be able to say, wait a second, an imine should be pretty similar to a carbonyl group. And that's also where if you, if you don't encounter it regularly, a book like, like Pretch or Silverstein becomes very useful. You can look up the details, but you can still start to calibrate based on just what you know in terms of some basic theory. Let's take this one more, one more step. <clears throat> 
let's look at a carbon deuterium bond versus a carbon hydrogen bond. So CH versus CD. And I'll take as a maybe common example, chloroform versus deuterochloroform. And so chloroform is just about in the typical CH region. In other words, chloroform is at 3020 wave numbers. And so the question would be, where does deuterochloroform come? And why, why would I care about that? So if we, look at, if we look at the reduced mass for a CH bond, and again, I'm not gonna put in decimal points here. We're just gonna use our atomic masses to the nearest, uh, to the nearest unit. Um, if I think about it, it's 12 times one divided by 12 plus one is equal to 12 thirteenths. And if I think about what it is for a carbon deuterium bond, and again, I'm not going to use the exact mass, I'll just round it to the, to the mass number 12 times 2 divided by 12 plus 2. And so now we get over here, we're at 24 fourteenths. Okay, so the force constant isn't going to change, right? You're going to have the exact same force constant for a carbon deuterium bond versus a carbon hydrogen bond, even though the carbon deuterium bond um, has, the deuterium has a different mass. So that means that if we factor out the pre-K in the previous equation and equate it, then we're going to end up with nu, nu bar CH times the root of the reduced mass Time for CH equals nu bar CD times the root of the reduced mass mu CD. And what we're trying to do is say, okay, what's the frequency? What's the number of wave numbers for a carbon deuterium bond? So we can just plug in all the numbers that we have. We have the carbon hydrogen bond for chloroform. So it's 3020 root 12 thirteenths is equal to our unknown nu bar times root 24 fourteenths. And when we factor all that out, we calculate that nu bar for CD equals 22 16 wave numbers. So this is, this is what we would estimate. And the actual value is pretty darn close. We've been treating our oscillator as just a carbon and a hydrogen and sort of ignoring these chlorines here. So it may not be exactly the same, but what we get from experiment is 2020 wave numbers. 20, 20, I'm sorry, 2050 wave numbers. So right about at the calculated value. Now, why am I giving this as an example here? Well, often if you're going to get an IR spectrum and maybe you're in a little bit of a hurry, you'll go ahead and use your NMR sample. And either, typically these days, we do attenuated total reflectance IR spec, uh, where we're using applying our sample to a crystal. So maybe you've applied your NMR sample to the surface of the ATR FTIR where you're detecting it and the chloroform largely evaporates but doesn't wholly evaporate. And then you see a peak at 2250 wave numbers and you say, oh, I have a nitrile or I have an alkyne in that sample. Well, no, you don't it's residual chloroform, just like you're used to in the NMR saying, oh, that, 
peak at 7.26 is the CHCL3 impurity in my CDCL3, you would look and say, oh, that's not significant. So having your wits about you is, is important. And that region, by the way, here, right in the sort of 2000-ish range is very interesting because there's not too many functional groups that appear there. There's carbon-carbon triple bonds, carbon-nitrogen triple bonds, nitriles appear there, cumulated systems appear there like various isocyanates and so forth. So it's an interesting region you should keep your eye on, but don't fool yourself. Well, this might be a good time to, uh, to stop and take some questions. Thoughts? So does lower number mean weaker or stronger bonds? Lower number means a weaker bond. So basically a stiff spring Mm -hmm. For that matter, hydrogens, of course, contribute. But if you're saying for sort of normal atoms, you know, second regular uh, carbon hydrogen, um, among those, you're going to have a weaker bond uh, leads to lower wave numbers. And for this region, we're, uh, reason, we're going to be talking about the fingerprint region, which is about 1,400 to 600 wave numbers. And for most big organic molecules, it's really hard to pick out individual single bond stretches in the fingerprint region because it's super crowded. And if you have a big molecule, there's a lot going on. So mostly what we're going to be referring to is the functional group region that say above, uh, above 1600. That's where most of the interesting stuff is going on for us. If you're an inorganic chemist where your molecules are maybe more focused and smaller, you might be focusing on metal halogen bonds and other sorts of bonds that are down in what organic chemists would say is the fingerprint region. But for most organic chemists, basically we're looking at this functional group region. I want to talk about instrumentation and specifically the infrared spectrophotometer. And before we get into anything that's, I don't want to say technical, but technically accurate, I want to reduce the instrument to its bare essentials. In other words, not a real instrument, but a concept of an instrument. And the concept, and this same concept would apply to, say, a UV vis spectrophotometer is you've got a source of light. Now, infrared light is in the heat range, right? If you go and you pick up French fries at, at McDonald's, they may have been under a heat lamp. It's just a glowing bit of metal, metal and ceramic in the case. That's your source. Then the light from that source is gonna go through the sample and then it's going to, and the order can kind of get swapped and the mechanics can kind of get swapped. Then it's going to be broken into a spectrum where the diffraction grating for a prism, in other words, we're going to go through the spectrum. And we're gonna see in a moment when we talk about FTIR that this is done in a way more conceptual fashion. So not only is this part a simplification, but also this part is a simplification. And then we go to a detector that detects the photons and gives out a signal. 
Now, why is this, why is this gross oversimplification so valuable? It takes you down to the basic essence. Your, your light has to be generated, it has to pass through a sample, it has to somehow get deconstructed into its component frequencies, and it somehow has to get detected. If you're using a sample cell that absorbs the light, it's going to get picked up. So if you're using, say, a KBR cell or a potass or a calcium fluoride cell for a solution, I'm sorry, a KBR pellet or a calcium fluoride cell or a sodium chloride cell for a liquid sample, your cell may absorb. Ditto if you're in solvent or you have residual solvent in there, it may absorb as well. So if you're doing a solution phase IR spectrum in chloroform, you're gonna see absorptions associated with that CH stretch and other stretches. And even if you have residual solvent, as I talked about, you might. Now, historically, the old style of instrument, which I think is also easy to understand, so I'll write this sort of as concept, just so your notes don't say it's a real instrument. If we talk about sort of the old style of instrument, it would be a double beam instrument. And the idea is you have to make some comparisons. First of all, your source doesn't emit a uniform intensity of light. In other words, the intensity of the source is going to vary across that range from 4,000 4, to 600 wave numbers. And then furthermore, you're going to possibly, if your sample is in, uh, in a solvent, you might want to subtract that out. So in reality, you're going to here, and this again sort of takes us to the next level of concept, you'll pass your IR through a sample and then through a reference or in the case, and I'll show you, a, I'll show you an FTIR spectrophotometer, you'll take a background and then subtract it in, in the computer. But then what you're going to do is you're going to be comparing both of them, so you'll have a mirror in the case of a double beam instrument that can go back and forth and admit either beam through, again, your grating or prism. To, uh, to the detector. And so at least this gets you in the idea that you've got, you've got background here. And you're not uniform. And those instruments, the, uh, the double beam instruments are still perfectly good instruments and, and perfectly workable instruments. Now, chances are, if you're buying or using a modern infrared spectrophotometer, it's going to be a Fourier transform IR. And the, this is where I think a lot of people throw up their hands and say, okay, I can't understand how this works. And it works on the principle of interference. It works on the principle that you don't have to have a direct correlation between what comes out and your spectrum. That you can have various mixing of frequencies of light and then deconvolute the spectrum out of there. So you still have your source, so you still have your glow bar. And then the source goes to a beam splitter. And half of the light goes to a fixed mirror. In other words, a mirror that doesn't move. <laughs> 
And the other half of the light goes to a variable mirror. A mirror that's on a piston that literally moves back and forth and a laser determines or measures the position of the piston. And so what happens is the light bounces off, and I'm sort of skipping the details on the optics. The light bounces off each of these mirrors and is recombined and then goes through the sample and into a detector and then to a computer that's going to deconvolute the interferogram. Now, the main principle that I want to talk about is here and just getting the gist of it. And that is that as this weird mirror moves, different wavelengths are going to interfere constructively or destructively. In other words, at some point that this mirror is at, you're going to have complete destructive interference at 1700 wave numbers and there'll be no light coming through at 1700 wave numbers. And at some other point the mirror's at, you're going to have complete constructive interference where the two, uh, the two reinforce each other. You'll have 1700 coming through. And of course, it's all the different wavelengths all at all at once coming into your interferogram. In other words, you're going to be, as those mirrors are moving, different wavelengths and different combinations are making it through the sample. Your detector is responding to all those different wavelengths coming through. You're not breaking it into here's the 1700, here's the 1699 and so forth. But then out in the end, you can deconvolute that interferogram. And that's the main principle. If you're working with a set, and the nice thing is you can do all the addition and subtraction in the computer. So if your sample is in a reference, you can subtract the reference. If you've just got air in the room that has water vapor in it, you can subtract out the air that has water vapor, unless again, you've stuck your face in the instrument and breathed water vapor and CO2 in there, uh, in which case your reference may not have much water vapor or CO2 and your breathing in it may put it, so you still may get a CO2 peak. But the point is you can subtract out your background. If your sample's in solvent or in a cell, you can subtract all of that out. And in the end, you get an IR spectrum. As I said in the past, people have often used cells or KBR pellet. These days, people often do attenuated total reflectance where you're placing your sample directly onto a crystal and light is bouncing up and down and up and down many times through the sample just going a few microns into the sample. So often you can apply even a solid sample or a thin film of sample from a solvent right onto that instrument and then you get your spectrum. And the nice thing about the fact that it's a modern process is you can cycle through and collect many, many scans and get signal averaging. And we'll be talking more about this in NMR spectroscopy, but in general, the signal goes up uh, linearly as you get more scans, but the noise goes up as the square root of the number of scans. So your signal to noise goes up as the square root of the number of scans, which means if your sample has is very weak, if you don't have much sample, you can double your signal to noise, get a less noisy spectrum by quadrupling your number of scans, say going from 25 to 100. Obviously, since each scan takes time, and this is the same principle for NMR, 
you get diminishing returns where maybe collecting 400 scans to quadruple your signal to noise gets to be awfully time consuming. But these are ways you can increase your signal to noise. So thoughts at this point or questions? All right, so from all of this, from all of this, we're going to end up with an IR spectrum. And I cannot, I cannot emphasize to you enough the importance of reading and interpreting your IR spectrum. Because figuring out what's a peak, what's something like, for example, that deuterochloroform band, what is significant is looking at a combination of peak position, peak intensity, and peak shape. So we're actually gonna look at IR spectra both today and later on as we go through the week. We're gonna look at it, but I want you to get used to sort of my pigeon drawing of an IR spectrum. And it's more than just a drawing, it's the way that I think about IR. And so in my mind's eye, I sort of think about what occurs at 3,000. I sort of think about what occurs around 1,600. And so I'm going to go ahead and sort of sketch out something where we might have some sharp spiky bands just below 3,000. A band here, say, just above 1600. And then we've got, and you'll see my, my concept of things, some stuff below 1600. And so my reading really often will focus on this region here, which we can call the functional group region. and trying to understand the peaks and what's significant. And probably for, so we can call this maybe, we'll say 3,600 to 1,600 is about where a lot of the good stuff happens in the IR spectrum. And then I hate to say it, but for this region, which we'll often call the fingerprint, region from about 1400 to about 600 wave numbers. Often I'm going to I'll largely ignore it. You might be able to pick out a CO single bond. I'm going to give you an exercise and show you, I'll give you a couple of exercises and show you just how elegantly you can actually read from subtle details, differences in alkene substitution, monosubstituted, disubstituted, cis, disubstituted, trans, trisubstituted, tetrasubstituted alkenes. We'll also take a look a little bit later on. You can sometimes, sometimes, sometimes see some subtle effects of aromatics over here between about 1650 and 2000. And there'll be some more stuff going on down here in the fingerprint region. And I might give you an example or two of this in the homework. All right, at this point, I want to go ahead and kind of, kind of summarize what I think we can get out and master from an IR spectrum. And so I'm gonna give us sort of the catalog of all the different things that I think 
that we will be able to come away from this course from this next week reading or seeing. So in the carbon hydrogen containing functional groups, we're going to be seeing, I guess maybe I'll capitalize that, F, G, S. We'll be getting alkanes, alkenes, arenes, and alkynes. For oxygen containing functional groups, we'll be getting alcohols, aldehydes, ketones, esters, acids, acid chlorides, carboxylic acids, of course, carboxylic acid and hydrides. And we'll also be looking at the effects of ring size conjugation and inductive effects. And then for nitrogen containing functional groups, For nitrogen containing functional groups, I'd like us to be able to, to recognize amides, amines, ammonium salts. Ammonium salts are incredibly ugly as are carboxylic acids. Nitriles and nitro compounds. Does that mean we're going to be able to look at a spectrum and say with certainty what everything is? Absolutely not. But as in so many cases in interpretive spectroscopy, you're going to be getting whispering in your ear. Some things are going to yell at you. Carbonyl's going to yell at your ear. But some things are going to whisper in your ear. But those whispers in combination with other data like NMR spectra and unsaturation numbers and mass spectra can start to formulate a picture in your mind of what's going on. I started with this epiphany of my own with this 1820 wave number peak but from the enolate product of reaction screaming at me that I had formed a beta-lactone, a small strained ring, because the combination of the screaming of the IR spectrum and my mechanistic understanding of I generated an enolate, it condensed with a ketone to form an aldolate, but it didn't stop at that point, it cyclized to a beta-lactone. Those two things immediately spoke to me, and that's how IR should be working. So let's get started here. And as I said, we'll start on this today. We'll continue on this on Wednesday and we'll probably spill into Friday to have enough, enough time to talk about reading all of these spectra. Now, I said that it's not just position. It's the appearance of the bands. And so some bands appear strong. Carbonyls are pretty strong. Why? Big dipole moment. So you get a big change in the dipole moment. CO single bonds are in the fingerprint region. You may well not be able to make them out, but they're going to be strong. So you may be able to get a little hint whispering in your ear that something is, say, an ester and not a ketone. CH bonds 
even though the difference of electronegativity between a hydrogen and a carbon is just a couple of tenths, I think it's what, 2.1 and 2.4, something like that, CH bonds tend to be pretty strong. Weak to moderate. We talked a little bit about alkynes before. So alkynes, Terminal alkynes for the carbon-carbon bond are typically not that strong. And again, I'm thinking the carbon-carbon bond of an alkene, not that strong, weak to moderate, but you probably can pick it out. Internal alkynes as well. But then you have what bonds that you usually don't see And we talked last time about internal alkynes, where often if you have two carbon groups on an alkyne, they're going to end up having no net change in dipole moment, or for example, fully substituted, tetrasubstituted alkenes. So this is, a, this is sort of a starting point. So that's kind of the, a little bit of an overview of intensity and what we're going to be looking for. And then we can also maybe talk about where the bonds, where the stretches are appearing. And by the way, are those CH bins I was talking about yesterday, Mon uh, Friday? Fingerprint region, which isn't which often, as I said, isn't very useful. But for CH stretch, generally pretty easy to pick out, generally very sharp as well as strong. I'll say very sharp, just to, to indicate that. And let's calibrate ourselves. Okay, so alkyl, Typically, we're talking about 3,000 to 2840 wave numbers. Alkenes, typically we're talking 3,100 to 3,000. Ditto for arenes you know, benzene, naphthalene, thiophene, parole, pyridine, all sorts of aromatic compounds, generally about the same. I'll just put a ditto mark. Now, although I'm focusing on the carbon-hydrogen stretch of, of an alkene, often you're going to see corroborating peaks that can talk to you as well. So for alkenes, for example, you're probably also going to see, depending again on whether it's internally substituted, whether you've got other stuff crowding out the region like an amid functional group, you may also see a carbon-carbon double bond stretch at about 1640 to 1670. And all of these numbers are sort of a little bit loosey-goosey. For aromatics, and again, you might see, for aromatics, depending on what the molecule is, you might see bands from about 2000 to about 1650, uh, various out of plane uh, or combination bands, I'll call them. Sometimes you will, you might not, but these can help, can help you, let me make that a little clearer. These can help you interpret your spectra and learn what you're getting. Alkynes, we're talking about 
3,300 wave numbers. And this is where being able to look at bond shape, or band shape rather, is very important because an alkyne CH stretch is usually pretty sharp and spiky. And you usually can tell that versus an alcohol OH stretch that's often broad and fat when it's hydrogen bonded. I'm gonna give you one more. And again, this is subtle. Aldehydes, so aldehydes have this CH here on the carbonyl group. And this CH often, you can pick out two bands. One at 28-20, one at 27-20. One of these is what you would call a Fermi resonance, which is basically a harmonic being excited by the CH stretch. And one of these is the actual CH stretch. But if you notice, it's just a little bit off of the edge of the 2400 region. In other words, you may be able to pick it out. That can be useful. You may not see it because there may be too much other stuff going on there. A big aldehyde is going to have a lot of other CH stretches in it. A small aldehyde, you know, like benzaldehyde may be easier to pick this out. But again, these are little things that are going to whisper in your ear. And of course, for an aldehyde, you're almost certainly going to see a carbonyl at about 1740 to 1720 wave numbers, giving you corroborating information. Of course, if it's a conjugated aldehyde, it may be at a slightly different wavelength. All right, well, I wanted to, at this point, I think I want to do one last thing before we, we stop today, and that's that I wanted to try projecting a couple of spectra here, and we'll see how well, how well the technology works here. So I'm going to see if I can share my screen here and hopefully wake up my iPad, and we'll see if the tech works. Can you see? Yeah, we can. <clears throat> you can see. All right. So let's take a look at this first spectrum. So what, what is it? <laughs> of all the compound classes we've talked about, what do we have here? Is that at least a carbonyl? Yeah, carbonyl, at least. Right there, C. I'd say no carbonyl, but C double C. Yeah, which, which is it? Is it a carbonyl or is it a carbon carbon double bond? It's an alkene. It's an alkene. These are all. Yeah, it's moderate. Yeah, look at this. And you notice this is a little bit sharp and spiky. And moderate is kind of meaning relative to other things. Now, admittedly, if it were a carbonyl and it were a molecule where you had 100 other carbons, that might be the strength of a carbonyl. That's the region where amides occur, right? This band here is at about 1640. It's a hair above 1640. It's about 1642 wave numbers. But you're getting some other information here, right? You're getting another band at about 3080. I guess I'm going to go to a smaller pen nib here you're getting another band. So yes, indeed, this is an alkene. In fact, this is a terminal alkene, like so. My handwriting is not, not up to snuff today. So that's what I mean by reading a spectrum. 
Now, when you get to the homework assignment, you're actually going to get, and I haven't talked about this here, I'll give you a little handout, which actually tells you how you can read some of these bands here that are also uh, bending and various other vibrations that can even tell you about the substitution pattern of an alkene. Now, what about this next sample over here? What is this? Terminal alkyne. Terminal alkyne. And what are the things that are cluing you into this? Uh, the moderate peak at 21-ish, 2110 is that? And yeah, it's about 2120 wave numbers. So we have it's sort of moderate and spiky. And what else? The sharp, strong peak at 33. And the sharp, strong peak at about 3,300. And that's going to be different than an alcohol looks. So yeah, that, that is cluing us in. And do you see any things that we're overlooking deliberately in, an, in the interpretation process that we're not getting particularly bent out of shape over in either of these spectra? The fingerprint reading? the fingerprint region, so we're going to overlook that. Anything else? Because there really is learning to read here. You notice that we're not getting too bent out of shape over these. I don't know what they are. They could well be interference, um, but there's nothing that we're getting bent out of shape over. We're not jumping up and down and looking at those and saying, oh my goodness, it must be an aldehyde. So it's this learning to read the relative intensities of the peaks, the shapes of the peaks, as well as the positions of the peaks. And it used to be that the Journal of Organic Chemistry would, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. It used to be that the Journal of Organic Chemistry would have people slavishly list every gosh darn band. Nowadays, they ask you, because IR is playing a smaller role, they're saying list the important bands, which are usually the functional group bands, which means a responsibility falls on you to choose among your data and choose what's significant, which is tough. And in some cases, some things are really, really hard to see, and it's a real judgment call. I'll tell you from my own experience, primary amines are pretty darn easy to pick up. Secondary amines, particularly in bigger molecules, not so easy to see that NH stretch. The NH stretch is pretty darn weak in secondary means. And I've had at least one JOC paper where I really had to squint and run my sample nice and thick and concentrated to see that peak. And I did report it, but it's a real judgment call there. And then, for example, over at that region for triple bonds, nitriles, surprisingly, in spite of having a big dipole moment, are not that strong. And I've had to squint on those. Well, I think that's a good stopping point for today. Any final questions or thoughts before we wrap up? I have a slight question. Yeah. Um, so when you mentioned like strong, um, sharp peak and kind of like, what is it called? like weak peak, I, I'm having a hard time kind of like distinguish the difference between those because it, it looks from the example, it seems that the um, sharp one is like pretty sharp, but the strong one is also really sharp too. And so I'm not sure what um, I would expect to see what it's supposed to look like. Well, let me, let me give you, let me jump ahead in our current, um, current example here. Let's see. And 
I don't think these will be too hard a spoiler. So if I jump ahead here and we look, for example, at the difference between, say, this peak and this peak, let me let me just go ahead. Maybe I'll maybe I'll uh, choose a different color here. If we look at the difference between this peak and this peak, they're both in the same region, but the alkene peak that we just discussed is narrower in width at the base or halfway up the base than this peak, which happens to be a carbonyl. It's not as high. This is percent transmission. So that's the other thing I should talk about. Whereas most spectra are plotted in absorbance, here we have percent transmission, which is essentially a logarithmic relationship. So if your peak goes down to here, only a tiny bit, maybe 10% of the light is getting through the sample. If your peak is going to here, maybe maybe I'll just truncate it, then maybe 50% maybe, uh, transmission. So maybe this is 10 and this is 50. 50% of the light is getting through the sample. So those are the sorts of differences. And then I talked about that subtle difference between an alkene and, uh, and, an al and a, a, a carbonyl over here in the carbonyl stretch. And again, maybe at the risk of spoilers, if we look at these two bands at 3,100 or 3,300-ish, 3, this is relatively sharp and this is broad. And we'll talk about this one and we'll talk about the remaining three spectra on Wednesday. So that's what I mean by reading your spectra. Well, it's 9.57. And at this point, I think I'm going to have to say goodbye to let you get going. Uh, we will pick up in our discussion section today at five o'clock and uh, talk about, uh, we'll talk about molecular modeling. So I will catch you later. So bye now.